this talk tonight, which is another reason we ask that you keep your cameras off because otherwise it gets a little funky if there's um, lots of different people other than the panelists whose cameras are on. So thank you for that. For those of you who don't know me, if it's the first time you're coming to a MOFAD program, welcome. My name is Sari Kamen. I'm the public programs director of MOFAD. We are the Museum of Food and Drink. We are currently a virtual museum as our physical space is closed because of COVID. So like every public institution, um, we have moved, we have pivoted to the online space and it is an absolute pr pleasure to still be finding ways to be in community with all of you and hosting amazing conversations with people tonight, not just in the United States, but in other countries too. Miriam coming in all the way from Mexico such an honor. Um, one, of the, one of the true silver linings of, of this pivot is being able to gather people from all over, which we normally wouldn't do. We would normally just say, hey, if you're in New York, please come and be on this program. Please come and watch this program. But now we have people tuning in from all over, which is so exciting and makes us feel like we are still gathering, even if we're not in the same physical space. So I so, so, so appreciate you being a part of this event tonight. And I hope you'll come to more events if you have not been. Um, for example, next week, we have a wonderful program with Simran Sethi, who I know is in the audience tonight. She's leading an amazing conversation about chocolate and biodiversity. Come back, come see us next week. I'm so happy she's with us this evening, such an honor. Um, we have a newsletter that is the best absolute way to find out about all of our programs and keep up to date. So I will absolutely bug you tomorrow with an email reminding you to do so, but you can always go to mofad.org and sign up for our newsletter and check out our calendar. Um, so with that, I'm going to start letting our panelists this evening introduce themselves. So why don't we start with Teresa? Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm Teresa Marius, and I'm an associate professor of anthropology um, and the associate director of um, the Food Systems Graduate Program at the University of Vermont. Great. I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> Thank you. Irwin. Hi, um, I'm Irwin. I'm from Mexico, I'm from Resurrección Puebla. I'm from the communities, uh, community of a Nahuatl speaker, indigenous, and also chef. And what I do is like um, doing cooking classes, used to do before the pandemic. And uh, um, so catering, like, uh, working with the community with the uh, share the stories about food about the uh, traditions of each, each food uh, history and how the uh, food is uh, related to the um, identity of mexican americans and also for those uh, who forget about the, uh, the traditions because getting lost about everything happens like <laughs> Thank you. Miriam. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Sari, and thank you, Alicia, for inviting me. I uh, live in Mexico City. I am full professor at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in the health department. And I am nutritionist and anthropology as well, anthropologist. And uh, I, um, my main uh, interest in research is about uh, sociocultural aspects in, of uh, food and food practices and food behavior, etc. in Mexico. And um, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Paloma. Hi, good evening. My name is Paloma Martinez Cruz and I am talking to you from Columbus, Ohio, where I teach in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese um, at The Ohio State University. And my recent book is called Food Fight, Millennial Mestizaje Meets the Culinary Marketplace. And so I've been interested in a cultural studies approach in terms of looking at images and signs and symbols and food languaging. So I'm interested in a, a cultural studies approach to the world of food and Latinx identity. Thank you. Um, and before I turn it over to Alicia, who is our guest of honor and who is going to lead our conversation tonight, 
I also just wanted to quickly mention that there will be time for a Q&A at the end of the program. Um, so your chat box right now, which is that little chat icon at the bottom of the screen, is closed, but we will open it back up at the end of the talk. So you can type your questions in for all of our panelists. So I'm going to go away right now and let Alicia take over and then I'll pop back in at the end for our Q&A. So Alicia, take it away. Thanks so much, Sari, um, and thank you to MoFAT for hosting this. It's really an honor. And as you said, it's just, you know, one silver lining of a terrible time that we're able to connect in this way in spite of dis distance. And so I'm just grateful to everyone to be here tonight um, and grateful that we can, you know, gather from, from further away than we ordinarily can. Um, and Sari really gave me such a wonderful, um, opportunity, which was to, to think up my dream panel um, to, to talk about these issues. And so I'm just so um, honored and thankful that my friends who are here tonight on this panel can, um, can could join us and uh, share all of the work that they're doing, which is so um, relevant to the themes. Um, and so I think what we're going to do is basically, um, I have a series of questions. Um, we're going to try to keep it as uh, casual and chatty as if we were sitting um, in the same room together on, on comfy couches, talk show style, um, even though we can't actually do that um, in person. But that's the vibe that we're going to try to, to achieve. Um, and, you know, it's, in, the, in this moment, um, there are so many things, you know, to, to worry about, panic about. Um, Paloma and I are from, we went to uh, high school a few miles from each other and knew each other from the age of 16 and our state is on fire. Um, and, you know, there's so many other issues that are metaphorically on fire right now. And so it can be hard to find the wherewithal to, um, to focus and to take a deep dive into any um, specific set of issues just because there are so many things to, to worry about. But I think, you know, if we can allow ourselves for the next hour or so to, um, to think about how, um, how our food system works, um, how much we're tied to Mexico and how um, much the pandemic has revealed um, the interlocking food system that, that ties our, you know, our, our continent uh, together and the vulnerabilities um, and the ways that we rely on um, some of the most vulnerable people in, in our societies um, to, to hold us up and to nourish us um, through thick and thin, um, through whatever comes. And, and um, so I think it's a good moment to think about these issues, even though they might seem um, to, to be settled in some ways, because uh, when I wrote Eating NAFTA, um, Food, Trade Policy, and the Destruction of Mexico, it was uh, published two, two years ago, almost exactly. I think tomorrow is my book's birthday. And, um, you know, it uh, was a moment when, um, you know, the USMCA was kind of being rebranded and Trump was, um, you know, really um, after running on a, on a campaign to kind of undo NAFTA and critiquing NAFTA, he ended up almost, um, you know, kind of reinforcing it and reviving it in ways that um, are, you know, not different enough in the ways that I think all of us here would hope that it would be um, in order to be revived. Um, it would have been destructive to undo it because um, so much is now reliant on it, but it also um, doesn't do enough to, to care particularly of the, the people who have been most disadvantaged by it. And so, um, you know, thinking about the ways that NAFTA has changed, uh, you know, the food landscape in Mexico and the way that it's changed Mexico and the, and the United States, you know, I think one of the biggest issues that I realized in my research was that, you know, NAFTA kind of freed the circulation of capital and goods, it's so easy now for an avocado to get into my hands here in New York City in the middle of winter. Um, and I've lived in New York City long enough to remember when that wasn't the case. And so I like that. I appreciate that. Um, but people are not, you know, a, a afforded the same mobility or the same um, fluidity of movement. And there was no provision for human mobility in NAFTA. And that 
you know, mere fact is one of the most cruel aspects of NAFTA, that an avocado has more um, <laughs> freedom of mobility than, than a person. Um, and we could say the same for a lot of other products. So I thought we would start off by just kind of talking about how NAFTA has changed the food landscape of Mexico. And I hope, you know, we could start maybe, you know, um, Irwin, you started by, by um, mentioning your, your community and, and your language community. If you could talk about what NAFTA has meant for, and the last 25 years of food policy has meant for your community and for yourself. Edwin, are you are you ready? Can I unmute you? Yeah. Cuando quieras, estás. Go ahead, Edwin, when you're ready. Si me escuchas? Oh, I think we might have technical difficulties. We'll come back. We'll come back. Miriam, do you want to do you want to take that one, and then we'll come back? Okay. Well, uh, for Mexico, the 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 main problem I think is not only the changes of the food landscape uh, about the products, no, that they're no in in suddenly were available and suddenly were no in all the the houses. I think that was at the end of a a process that began in the 40s in the last uh, century, no? Because the industrialization and all the process of urbanization and modernization and all the modern, no? Sessions, <laughs> you know? So uh, I think was the, the end of that. At the beginning of that, the most, and, and the end, you know, this process where NAFTA, no? Oh, arrived to close all these process, no? or to, to, to say yes, to close all this process or at the end of this process was uh, the main uh, question for me, the main uh, issue, no, is that, uh, that that means a change, a cultural change, you know, the, the main impact is a cultural impact where all the people finally uh, have the possibility or has the possibility to uh, to get some access to to the uh, new products, no? But they are they were been thinking about that for a lot of time, you know. Then finally, they have the possibility to 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 buy some things, no? That they um, they were saying, seeing, sorry, no, and looking in the supermarkets and in the process of urbanization, etc. No, for for me, the main problem is that, or was that, and and this this cultural change that uh, finally, no, have the to everyone to be a consumer, uh -huh, a big consumer. Uh -huh and the possibility to do it and at the same time the increases of the prices of the fresh fresh food you know no mm -hmm. i i hope i i hope that it was understandable <laughs> yes very much thank you Miriam. irwin irwin can you tell us about what it meant for your community um nafta and the changes that nafta brought for for puebla and and for your community in particular uh, yes, um, it was long time ago, like in the 90s, with uh, President Salinas de Gortari. And I saw the change of uh, the Tra Tratado de Libre Comercio. Mm -hmm. And I saw the the peso, man the money in Mexico, lost the value. Mm -hmm. And become like people getting poor. Because mm -hmm. you have like a hundred pesos, you have the end, like... 10 pesos, like 90% mm -hmm. like of the, the value of your goods lost it. Mm. So, and the next president do something into the NAFTA now, it's getting worse for the communities because there is, the, what I saw with, the, with some, like NAFTA is more for the corporation, it's not for the people or communities. They're always getting, uh, getting in trouble every time something like that. 
because they don't see like uh, small farmers. They always go to the big corporations. It's like um, selling the corn in Mexico, like a small, like a family. Mm -hmm. They cannot compete like a corporation, like in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, because they use also um, seeds with genetic modifications. They grow mm -hmm. fast. They they need less care and they sell a lot but the quality is bad mm -hmm. that's when i step up when i do my food because i cannot make something like products with genetic modification because the even the flavor is is so, so poor mm -hmm. so when i do my food even as a small menu i have to take care of what i have because um the otherwise i would be like this like everybody else so that's the problem also people getting sick because um and when what i saw when the people change the food because it's cheap getting sick there's not enough nutri nutrients with, with the food also that's the one of reason the mass migrations because mm -hmm. They, they used to live out of the, uh, where they have in the land and sell something. Now the value is a uh, competition with the corporation. Now you gotta move somewhere else to make money because what you had before, there's no a lot of money you make with uh, little you sell, like the seeds or maize or some tortillas. It's, like, it's not good for the, um, the small communities. It's mm -hmm. getting uh, hurt everybody else. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I saw. That's why I came here because what I, I used to do in Mexico is not enough money to live in. Yeah. 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 The, um, the health consequences have been so striking. And as you mentioned, the, the nutritional content is just not the same, even between industrial corn and traditional corn, it's not nutritionally the same. And if we're talking about all of these foods that Miriam was mentioning in terms of the the processed kind of supermarket foods, there's just no comparison. I was so fortunate to take some of your courses when you taught about nixtamalización and the way that nixtamalizar el maíz um, releases the nutrients in ways that um, industrial foods, you know, don't, there's no kind of um, comparable processed could you could you just mention that a little bit in terms of how yes um that's what happened to me when i came to united states also i feel it i feel the difference eating tortilla because uh i saw in the supermarkets they sell tortilla everywhere different brands but they use um uh, citric citric acid acid mm -hmm. to preserve the tortilla even you put outside like come on the tortilla is still there but mm -hmm. in the manifestation, it's like for one, two weeks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they want, they don't want to like lose the money. So you put more, get into like uh, preserve and the bad quality. And I feel myself getting sick when I came here the first time. In the first five years, I get sick and, you know, like everything in my body feel different, even my feel weak. And when I changed my diet with uh, with nistamalization, corn tortillas, mm -hmm. I feel more strong, more energetic. It's only for tortillas. Now, like vegetables, the the cheese, it used to be even the, the milk. When I get here, I, I drink the milk. It's like, I feel the difference. When it's like natural milk from the cow, cow through home, from the small farm in Mexico and then in here, like, I don't know how they make the milk. Feels mm -hmm. a difference. Because I never saw, when I used to live in Mexico, people has uh, like lactose intolerance. Yeah. Now here, it's a lot. Because yeah. the industrialization, even the milk, the people do it, it's getting really bad. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I never had problem with uh, bread. When I get here, feels the difference, the same. The bread. Now, I remember, like, I didn't even know about uh, gluten intolerance. Like, you now I here, like, it's a lot of people. It's not only one of you. It's a lot. When I, I do something like 
they asked me when I used to cook in a restaurant, I'm a gluten uh, free, like I understand. But then, <laughs> then when I get here, I start hearing those like uh, uh, new words, intolerance, like those uh, gluten free, uh, soy, soy, like so many uh, um, intolerance for food because the quality is not good. That's why. Is That's why it's getting new disease. Yeah, I mean, you know, all of the things you're saying are so true, but also a, a tortilla made from good corn with nixtamalizado, the flavor is is so much better. You can oh, taste the yeah, difference. Yeah, exactly. It just is yeah, so when I when I change it, I, I have a new tortillas from nixtamal, and I I I saw that I start selling the tacos now. People say, "Oh, this is really good." And looks simple, but yeah, it's because the tortilla has a lot of uh, it's a lot of work. It's like have the the, the taco, the ingredients, the, the food, yeah. and the tortilla has to be the certain way to to reach the flavor. Yeah. So now when people eat the tortilla, this is really good, but they don't understand because it's the tortilla has to be the the, the way it is. The stamilization, yeah, you have to like respect the ingredients. Something they don't. They don't know, they don't do with the um, industrialization because they want to yeah. use money. They don't care about everything else. Yeah. Even the health of people, they're getting sick, they don't care, they just want to make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and also what you're referencing is that NAFTA has really also changed the landscape of, for food in the United States. You know, we in the United States are eating very differently today um, because of NAFTA, but our food system, the labor, um, the environmental impact, the way that we specialize in different products has also dramatically changed in the last 24 years. Um, Teresa, in your book, which is just so um, rich and, and descriptive of the lives of the, the farm workers um, at what you call the other border, um, at the northern border in Vermont, um, are really living a story of those shifts. Um, could you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so interesting to hear um, the two perspectives because um, most of my work in Vermont has been very ethnographic and talking with farm workers from Mexico, most of whom are from you know Chiapas and Veracruz and some in, from Tabasco, and um, talking to them about um, my, my my book really focuses on how people's access to food has shifted as a result of moving to the United States and living in a very cold and very white place <laughs> um, that is uh, very Northern. Um, and I think what I realized through doing the, the, ethnography, for, the ethnography for this is that, um, you know, people have these memories of these kind of landscapes of food that Irwin is talking about and that Miriam were talking about. Um, but that, you know, NAFTA um, has such a devastating impact on their family's ability to continue um, those kinds of food traditions and food practices that, you know, migrating to the U.S. became one of the few options that people had, um, which, you know, is not just happening in Vermont, of course, but um, I think what I've realized is as people are living here, they might have these memories of these foods that were so important to them um, and so meaningful to them, but then they have this really difficult decision about how they're going to feed themselves here in Vermont or, you know, and feed their families. And a lot of that comes down to like, am I going to have no tortillas at all? Or am I going to have tortillas made with maseca? You know, am I going to have, you know, uh, these meals that remind me of my mother's cooking? Um, or am I going to, you know, eat the food that a 70 hour work week allows me to, to have? And so, I'm so interested in just how these labor demands that are put upon immigrant workers um, have an impact on the kinds of foods that they're eating um, as they are directly responsible for feeding us mm -hmm. and, you know, as, as the broader public. So yeah, I think the, the border dynamics were really interesting to me. Um, and when I first talked about this book, you know, a lot of the responses were, wait, there's people from Mexico and Vermont. <laughs> you know, that's not, <laughs> not necessarily a, a story that people think about. And there are, um, not a huge community, but a community that's so absolutely essential to the functioning of the food system here. Um, even we have to see image. 
I'm sorry. And we have this image of Vermont, you know, the cows on the, on the, in the pasture. It's this very pastoral, idyllic image. And your book, the, the, the degree to which workers without documentation are spatially confined yeah. just blew, pulled me over because a lot of people don't know, don't realize that how close you are to the border if you're within a certain number of miles, um, ICE can, you know, pick up anybody at any time for any reason. And so yeah. a lot of folks are just not even able to get to the supermarket. If this, if the supermarket had the tortillas, they wouldn't necessarily be able to get there to buy them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Combined with um, the labor patterns and, and the rural nature and the difficulty in transportation, but yeah, the border dynamics and the fear of border patrol and, and immigration and customs enforcement that um, it creates this condition where people are not eating how they would like to be eating. However, it also has opened up really interesting opportunities, especially for women who want to create small businesses and you know catering enterprises as happens in Mexico, of course, as well, right? That we see you know, amidst these really grinding sort of examples of of structural violence um, openings for people to exert this resiliency and and create the kind of um, meaningful meals that they that they want to share with people. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of tortillas, Paloma and I, we already mentioned, grew up <laughs> in California. Um, and even though my family was white and yours is Latinx, we both, I think, probably knew that the one thing you could always ha find in the refrigerator and the kitchen would be tortillas. <laughs> um, I think that's the common denominator for many California upbringings. Um, and we found our way east um, to, for, for our studies and into places where you can't always get good Mexican food. But there's now suddenly um, this boom in which Mexican food is more popular probably than ever. Um, there are more, um, options of a very um, delicious, fresh um, food. Um, but this is a mixed blessing and your book, Food Fight, is just so vivid. Um, it, it's, it's wickedly funny in the way that you <laughs> describe this very contradictory moment that we're in. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, you can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. In well, where to start? The reflecting on these wonderful observations and these very saddening experiences. Um, you know, I think about how right now there's a boom in um, high-end interest in Mexican food, right? Mm -hmm. Mexican cuisine um, is is really having a moment. And it's not lost, I think, on people of, uh, on Mexicanos and people of Mexican descent. It's not lost on us that um, only few people can afford to buy the heirloom beans, the organic, you know, um, tortilla, things that are produced local. So what historically poor people, people with limited economic means would have access to and just be able to have their family farm. Now, that is exclusive. And because I deal with cultural messages, mm -hmm. there's also this layer of elite people, non-heritage chefs, making these claims about rescuing it or discovering it. And I'm sure tonight's audience is probably familiar with the Rick Bayless mm -hmm. um, type of Anglo entrepreneur who is capitalizing or leading the charge on rescuing or discovering these traditional foods. And then that is an aspect um, that fits within the logic of colonization. And my shorthand is colonization means always be extracting, right? Mm -hmm. And for us to decolonize, it means always be adding back the context and challenging people not just to extract this one product that they desire and mm -hmm. saying, look what I discovered, mm -hmm. 
but understanding that a whole matrix of humanity is connected to that mm -hmm. and to understand the violence of saying we want your chalupas mm -hmm. but we don't want your children yeah. right so that is um that is that are those are some of the the ironies that i deal with with you know <laughs> a bit of a sarcastic uh, maybe a sense of humor when i can it's I, a powerful I, I, tool. It really yeah, is. that's the, it is. And <laughs> to, that's how I stand, right? I think I, I, I comparto con muchos mexicanos y mexicanas ese sentido de humor, you know, de, que es bien oscuro, right? Like saber reírse, you know, en la cabeza de la tragedia, right? To know mm -hmm. how to laugh in the face of tragedy. Yeah. So we deal with this like kind of a hipsterism in, the, in our food ways when middle income and lower income are eating garbage yeah. that has been because the his the heritage foodways have been extracted yeah. and manipulated um so, it's really yeah. sad sad and and tragic and ironic the way that that narrative that salvage narrative almost relies on its profitability is is exactly kind of parallel to how much it's been kind of oppressed and, and suppressed and destroyed. Because if you can't say that you're really salvaging something on the verge of extinction, you can't charge those outrageous prices, yeah. right? So if everybody has access to good tortillas, yeah. and you know you can't charge seven dollars for six of them, um, and so this you know narrative that that it you know, elevates them. I'm using all these continuous scare quotes, forgive me, but I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> you know, this, this elevation at the same, quote unquote, at the same time is, you know, really just about speculation and, and telling a story for the purposes of generating a profit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. While being participating in a system that collaborated in the total erosion of the quality that middle income, average income, mm -hmm. Mexican entrepreneurs and chefs and restaurant owners can have access to. Absolutely. So like depressing, it's depressing the value, depressing the quality, um, ransacking those lands that produce this heritage food and then cornering the market on who gets to have access to the real quality. And then of course, like we've been discussing the, the discovering it or rescuing it, um, mm -hmm. conquest tropes conquest. all over again, which is, we refer to it as, uh, you know, um, Columbus effect, right? <laughs> Columbus, Ohio, right? So the Columbus <laughs> effect of, of saying it's only real when white people have discovered it yeah. because never mind thousands of years of indigenous people being stewards of this, of these food ways. It's when white chefs, Anglo chefs have, are making profit off of it and telling other white people how to engage with it, that it seems to be seen. They're my, they're my short quotes. I'm joining you. Yeah, I, 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 that. Give me some contagious. of these. <laughs> it's contagious. Miriam, <laughs> jump in there. Tell us, tell us what this looks like from where you sit. Um, I, I want to say that it was very illustrative that Paloma, no, say, because you know, this process of only use the cultural traits of your food is now using, using or use it, no, by our uh, politici politicians, you know, mm -hmm. they are, no, uh, they are really glad to say, hello, we are going to announce the Milpa diet. No, and they want only your food, but you don't want your lifestyle. You don't want to you no to eat sugar or to make so many parties or celebrations. No, you know there are a lot of, uh, and I realize now that it's also a process of colonization inside to Mexico mm -hmm. uh -huh, because you know no the, Mexico is a very stratified society. So the highest, no, including the politicians, you know, and the officials that they are now deciding the food policies, etc. Uh -huh. And they are defining all these romanticization, romantic, romanticization, 
romanticization Romantic. idea no Romantic. about Romantic. indigenous uh, food and traditional food and inventing you know and I imagining no the the how people may no the eat in order to have a splendorous life and healthy and related to earth, you know, and they are all the time, no? Having That's this so interesting. So if I understand you, um, in the transition between Peña Nieto, who was the pr prior president and the new, not so new, a couple years now, Lopez Obrador, mm -hmm. um, you're saying that because under Peña Nieto, part of, you know, what I was, I was really struck by was that the milpa based cuisine was not being seen as a resource for health. Yes. Uh -huh. That when there was discussion about nutrition and the, you know, proper diet, it was really about, you know, eat whole wheat bread and light yogurt and <laughs> um, diet soda. And I was appalled that, you know, these traditional foods that um, didn't come associated with terrible health consequences were not being seen as a resource. So now it sounds like you're saying that it's sort of flipped and now traditional food is being used as always, right? We shouldn't be surprised as anthropologists as a weapon against the same people that are always being, um, you know, the same so, so people who, who now, you know, are consuming um, foods that they're not supposed to eat are being, you know, scolded for not eating enough of the milpa based diet. Is that, am I getting it correctly? Yes, correctly. And it, is, it, is this what I realized because I've been thinking for many days about this idea, how to, no, to conceptualize this idea. And what I realize now with, the, with Paloma said, no, is, it's the same process. It's the same yeah. process, you know? And no matter what, it's it's wealthy, usually white, usually skinny elites who are, you know, kind of whatever anyone else is doing, they're establishing or, or, their uh, uh, scientists from public health now, yeah. no? Saying that we need a more traditional diet. Okay, explain me. What does it mean, man? No? Interesting. Explain me, no? Uh, what well, I'm, I'm going to do about the traditional system, not yeah. so only about traditional diet, no? What about traditional system? What about the traditional system of uh, work, uh, the traditional system of uh, household organization, the traditional system about everything that is related to food system and to diet? Yeah, well, and we can't forget that that's a very patriarchal food system that relies very heavily on female domestic yes, labor of historically yeah um so okay. Okay. let's talk about things that make us excited as far as you know resistance to you know these these systems and these processes which give us so much to be angry about um Irwin, you are you you win um the optimism award because you happen to just open a taqueria during a pandemic, we salute you. <laughs> Can you tell us about how <laughs> you um, gathered the uh, valentia to, you know, put this, you know, lifelong journey of, of celebrating your food and your culture um, into the form of a taqueria in Queens on Roosevelt Avenue. You can give us the address because some people are local and we'll go and eat your samitas. Um, but what's it like to, to open Asholotol Taqueria during, during this time? Fine. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, um, because I don't longer have a uh, cooking classes my food share like the food and it's not work many like like me many people here in queens we don't have the luxury to have a paycheck like everybody else you know on employment work from home that's the one the one reason the other reason is there's uh, no other way i have to improvise i have to be extraordinary whatever i have to do next step the pandemic mm -hmm. and it's still the same idea it's like the food has to be respected mm -hmm. because when i started doing my tacos and the first week everybody asking for lettuce and uh, sour cream mm -hmm. and 
It's like, no, this is real Mexico. This is guaca no guacamole. No. Cochinita, baby, it has to be like the cochinita it is. No guacamole. And it was hard in the beginning because nobody believed me, like close friends. And no, we are very close, like, because it was hard time and like, it's not gonna be sales. And I have no options. And I called the, um, the owner of, uh, now he's dying, Cevicheri and Ray. And the same law say, says, if you don't sell food, you no longer be able to, to open your business. And in the, in the pandemic, many restaurants, they don't have, uh, they don't prepare to, to leave out of like take out food. It is always dine in, and this is when you make money, eating, drinking. Yeah. And like where I, I am right now, there's like, it's no way to make food like that, really make money like that. Hmm. So I present my project, he said, like, okay, hey, let's try, let's see it this way. <laughs> so, like, we, you know, we got agreement, so I opened the place. And the same idea, just teaching everybody about the, the food, the importance of uh, real Mexican food, and share the story of which food the, the, the we used to be in the cooking classes. And the most um, interesting uh, idea, people, they recognize there's the different flavors, different tastes, the, the other food. Because this food, this is not new. This is a very old recipe, like cochinita pibil, that's Yucatan. Mm -hmm. Like um, al pastor, I still respect the ingredients, no shortcuts, like the same before. Like everybody likes uh, Mexican food, but don't nobody likes Mexicans. Mm. But if you know the story of Mexican, you gotta understand first, if the way to understand a Mexican is through food for me, because, um, for me, when I make food, I represent freedom. Each food I make is for freedom because even they still attack Mexicans. When I present my food, they say, oh, this is really good. And I tell the story. I tell the, the, the background of each dish. And they say, this is because the Mexican. Because I remember and, and the story of Mexican, they don't longer in, in the colonial time. Mm -hmm. They cannot do ceremonies. They only set places in the kitchen mm. because you can you can you have fire all the elements for the ceremony for the indigenous. That mm. was a safe place, and you can see in the day of the dead. That's why they have a huge holiday. It's good excuse to have a ceremony for the dead for those mm -hmm. traditions. So in the Mexican cuisine has the spirituality. When you spread you your feelings, everything through food. And, and I have a, um, the, the honor and, and the chance to do it. For me, it's like freedom. That's why I say the Mexican food for me is freedom because I don't follow uh, the corporation says like uh, produce, like seasoning, like they sell you. This is, a, this is your tradition, uh, like canned food. This is from you, like ancestors. Even I saw not long ago, uh, green salsa, and they put images like the uh, Aztec stuff, like that. but that's new. That's not, that's not a tradition. The, the tradition has to be the way it is and respect it because if you lose that one, they're gonna manage yourself because you no, you no longer have power to yourself. You're gonna follow them and then they're gonna sell whatever they have to you. And you for me, that's why, that's why when I said there's freedom because it's from my my ancestors. They're still doing the same thing. I still uh, repeat what I learned through food and the language. I still I'm probably I'm the last person who cares about the language and food. But no. even that, I'm still uh, willing to do everything into the end because prob probably this is uh, like this is the mirror. Yeah. After that, you no longer to see uh, uh, the way in the mirror because when I finish my journey, the mirror is going to be broken. Mm. And everything I know is going to go away. If I don't share anything, it's going to lose. 
the way I think, the way I share, the way I cook, it's gonna be a way. So this is the last chance to whoever wants to learn, I'm gonna teach the whatever, uh, everything I can, yeah. I highly recommend becoming your student. It's a very beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can testify personally, but what you just said is so powerful because you made a parallel between the Spanish colonialism that everything was sort of prohibited and suppressed except food. So food became this supercharged um, arena of, of, of meaning and an opportunity to almost keep things alive that were being prohibited in other arenas. And we have the same thing happening now with neo-colonialism with the United States. We have this circumstance where everyone loves their guacamole and their, and their tacos. But um, as you said, and Paloma said that we have a very big problem of anti-Mexican sentiment in this country. And so um, the food is becoming a vessel and a, and a vehicle for asserting dignity and rights and a, and a, and a subtle message um, obliging a different kind of reckoning and recognition and, and dignity. Um, and it makes me think, and, um, Teresa, in your book, when you're talking about the, the farm workers in Vermont who, who, as you mentioned, work such grueling long hours, 70 and 80 hour weeks on dairies and on farms where they're really, um, you know, just uh, so um, such long taxing hours. And then when people get access to, to grow their own food, you would think it, in some ways it would be the last thing they would wanna do would be to do more <laughs> um, farming or gardening after doing farming or gardening for someone else. But there's something very empowering about the stories that you tell in your book of people um, really finding a different kind of meaning and, and getting access to, to land for growing their own foods. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, the research that I've done has really only been possible because of this applied work that I've also done, which um, is a collaboration with some colleagues here at the University of Vermont Extension. Um, and in this project that is part of a broader health, uh, health access project for farm workers, um, we collaborate with farm workers who want to plant kitchen gardens um, at the dairies that they're working. And yeah, it seems like a really unlikely project to succeed. We have maybe two months of summer here, and you know we are um, we're collaborating with people who are working you know really long hours. But um, the the gardens that we help plant are really sort of emphasizing those foods that people would never find in Vermont: certain herbs, certain chilies, um, even just certain varieties of tomatoes. And I just I've always been really impressed by this project how um, people, you know, find um, this this tremendous sort of sense of meaning and sense of connection to a place that has been often very hostile towards them. Um, so, you know, we work mostly in on dairies that are in the border counties, um, places where food access is really severely compromised. And, um, you know, I think the, the best story that comes in from my book is this individual. He was 64 years old when I interviewed him. He had lived and worked in the U.S. for 40 years um, and described how, you know, especially prior to 9-11, he would go back and forth to Mexico. He had a much more sort of, um, you know, sort of bi-national experience. But at the time that we were working with him, he had lived in Vermont for um, about eight years. He hadn't been home in those eight years. Um, so he's working 70 hours a week on his dairy. And um, alongside that, he was growing, I would probably estimate like a half to a three quarters acres worth of garden space around the, um, the trailer where he was living. And he would, um, he was sharing this food with people he lived with. There's a couple of other farm workers in his household. He was known to package up food and mail it to his kids who were living in Maine and working in Maine. Um, anyone who went by his house was like sure to leave with a sort of tremendous like, trunk full of food. Um, <laughs> as, you know, it was really great as I was doing interviews with him. But I think, you know, we, we I think especially within sort of the scholarship on farm workers and the understanding of farm workers, um, you know, we see, we see the drudgery, we see the, the hours, we see the isolation, um, but I think we need to pay equal attention to all of the really like creative, inventive, resilient ways that people get by. 
And I think gardens are a place where all of that really happens. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's a hopeful story. Things have also really changed in the last three years. Farm workers that we had worked with for, you know, the first eight years of the project had um, decided not to grow anymore because they were afraid of being seen outside their homes after Trump was elected. And so, you know, all of these sort of micro level experiences that people are having, you know, right around their homes are, are so connected with this broader set of politics that we're thinking about. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a really great project to be a part of. And, you know, like any good ethnographer, you have to kind of like think about what is your way in and how are, how are going to people going to trust you? And, when you show up with papalo seeds and you know chipiline seeds, then they're like, "All right, you must be all right." Well, <laughs> you a little bit. So, yeah, it's been it's been a very cool project to be part of. That's great. Um, I I there are so many topics that uh, we could talk about all night, but um, one of the things that you know is happening obviously right now is you know this kind of convergence that we're seeing in terms of the pandemic and the and the the fires in California, the flooding and the storms in the South, um, the food system, the incredible food insecurity um, that we're seeing in this country, this, um, you know, real contrast between what we consider um, essential and what's kind of being framed as almost sacrificial um, in terms of, of the people who um, don't have access to uh, paycheck protection, don't have access to stimulus checks um, or work from home options. Um, Paloma, how, I, I know you're thinking about some of these things for your new project, if you could talk a little bit about it. This, yeah, this, um, in the year that's ahead of me, counting academic years, um, I'm working on something that I'm calling Becoming Essential. And so I'm reflecting on how we're seeing history repeat itself a little bit, right? Um, we saw the, in the, around the World War II era, we mm -hmm. saw the Bracero program go hand in hand with Operation Wetback. Mm -hmm. So we saw people recruited to perform work in the fields to do crop work while servicemen, while a lot of people were at war overseas. Mm -hmm. And then these mass deportations were also taking place um, and sometimes consecutively, right? Like at the same time rather. Mm -hmm. And now we have a loosening of H2, it, it was, was it H2A visas? I think now I'm just drawing a blank, but that's, I think that's the name of the guest worker visa. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but um, that is going hand in hand with a total intolerance of undocumented workers who um, it's been reported that up to 75% of the worker of the, of the crop workers um, are undocumented. And even with the visas, even with these um, temporary loosening of guest worker programs, these are totally in the hands. They're completely administered by the employers. So it's entirely up to the employer, basically, to define how legal or illegal mm. the workers are. Mm. So there's a, a lot of abuses that take place because of this system, which is remarkably like a sharecropper type of system mm -hmm. or an indentured servitude type of system, right? So we're hearkening back to really ugly moments in American labor history so the the what, what I would call the, the neoliberal language of it is that, yes, they're undocumented, which means they're illegal, which means they're criminals, but they're making our lettuce cheaper, mm -hmm. but they're, you know, they're making, you know, pork chops happen. So I, I think that... Um, out there we're talking about what where can we find that hope where can we find you know some progressive action um that is transforming things in the right direction right where's that transformative front line and i think the coalition of immokalee workers mm -hmm. uh, based in florida tomato crop workers um primarily that they are using a human rights approach to the dignity of workers not just saying we're we're okay because we're picking your lettuce but saying these are people who have rights to have rights mm -hmm. right? which is different than your lettuce gives me my rights exactly and so That's i think an important distinction 
Yeah, yeah, because we know that they're, that, you know, just talking about somebody as a worker and saying they're only useful as a worker, that pendulum swings really fast. And it just, it, it, we need to shift the conversation so that we're talking about people who have rights to have rights. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and the Fair Food Program is an easy way to kind of go and associate, your, acquaint yourself with what, um, w what regulatory systems and what consumer driven and worker driven um, re resistance fronts you can find in the food provisioning system. Mm -hmm. I also look at um, I also look at fair trade, which doesn't go far enough, but it takes a step in the direction that we want to see, which is um, and and it, that was in the 80s that it started entering into the lexicon of our food provisioning system in this country, where it was first crafts from Central America, from Guatemala. The low the expression was trade, not aid. Mm -hmm. And um, now we have a lot of coffee coming from fair trade farms. And the people are faring a lot better that come from, you know, so, so if you can, if you're not someplace where you can go to, if you can't go to Irwin's Taqueria, you know, if you can't go to like Home Girl in, in LA or Cosecha in Oakland or some of these restaurants where you know, have a very deep commitment to what food provisioning means and all of its, you know, different layers, mm -hmm. um, you can at least go into the Target and buy a fair food, you know, pound of coffee. Because yeah. thanks to consumer awareness, Thanks to students and churches, church parishes, and students on college campuses insisted that they have access to fair trade coffee, mm -hmm. insisted that their t-shirt not be made in a sweatshop. Mm -hmm. So just turning it back to everybody who's joining us tonight and acknowledging how much power every, you know, when you go and spend some money on a cup of coffee, you're also voting for the world that you want to see. Absolutely. And let's not forget to say if you're eligible, please register and vote, register and vote, register and vote. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we vote every day in every way um, with our wallets and um, at the ballot box. So thank you for that so much. Um, so I thought it might be fun just as uh, our guests here tonight are um, uh, thinking of questions, you know, the, the, the audience, if you want to come up with your, your questions. In the meantime, I just have a lightning round of questions for our panelists. Um, what is one thing that you think people in the United States really misunderstand about quote unquote Mexican food? Um, Irwin mentioned people asking for sour cream and lettuce. So we'll, we'll have that on the chalkboard as our first um, item that everything needs to have sour cream and lettuce, definitely a no-no. Um, what are some other things that you all have, have come across that you think people just really don't understand? I think, I think for me that it's all the same, right? That there's no regional differences. I think that that's such an important thing, but we often overlook that, you know, food from Oaxaca is so incredibly different from food in the northern border um, states that it's not all the same and it's sort of beautiful in all of its diversity. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. What else? Edwin, you probably have the margarita. The, the, the margarita is from um, California. It's from Los Angeles in the 1950s <laughs> and it was a substitute for a daiquiri. <laughs> some women came into a, I think at El Toro's or, a, you know, so one of those like early waves of middle class sit down restaurants in the mid century. And some women had their checks. It was a Friday. They wanted something celebratory and it was a Mexican restaurant. And so instead of a daiquiri, <laughs> it, you swap out and you put tequila in there. And then that was how a margarita happened. So a lot of what we think of as Mexican food is actually made in the United States for Anglo palates and preferences. No, it's for Anglo consumers. And then that becomes the scaffolding of what um, a lot of people consider to be authentic. Mm -hmm. So the margarita is a, is a north to south uh, mm -hmm. migrant. There you go. And sometimes Margarita. everyone calls the other Maybe one the Caesar over. salad, right? The Caesar salad came from Tijuana. Caesar is Mexican. <laughs> Yeah, but um, some food we need to keep it uh, because um, it's very important. Don't lose uh, the foundation. 
it's like um, pozole. I have pozole, and I am very like jealous about pozole taking care because it's one of the oldest recipe. And now, if you Google recipe of pozole, everybody's gonna talk about the pork, the pork. and it's, the hero has to be the corn. Pozole means uh, fermentation in Nahuatl. And I remember when you were in the class, you never eat pozole because you always have meat or something like that. Yeah. Even when I when I went to buy some corn, uh, they asked me, what do you need this a lot? Of, because I want to make pozole. Oh, you have the cabeza de cochino, the pork head. That's, no, I don't need any meat. Why? You have to put that one. Because it's like uh, the soul of pozole, is the corn, it's the hero, not the meat, not the pork. It's the bubbles, right? And now what? Doesn't that mean the bubbles? Yeah, the bubbles, like a little bubbles. When they get in fermenting, they got little bubbles on top, but that's mean pozole, the mm -hmm. And many dishes like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, the, for me, it's like the foundation of each dish. Don't lose your background because it's like the foundation and from that, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand what is your past, you can not put your feet in the air because you have a gap there. Mm -hmm. uh, even the molly, it has the history. Even uh, the beans, different type of beans. If you don't understand, it's like um, it's like very popular uh, Mexican restaurant in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. He's a good chef. He has a really good food, delicious. Mm. But the problem is he didn't do his homework mm. because the name is a Nahuatl, different civilization. And his food is from Oaxaca. Mm. Two different like um, concept mm -hmm. and the mix. It's like, uh, I'm gonna put like uh, Apache dishes with a Mohawk name, mm. right? And people, they don't know, they're getting confused. And that's what happened with the dishes in Mexico. If they don't understand what happened, in the end, they're gonna focus on the pork, and the pork is from Spain, mm -hmm. right? It's like, and many of like very old tradition food, Mexican, we don't have pork, mm -hmm. because the pork is from Spain. They, they brought with their, right. with their colonialism. So if you, if you understand, each dish from Mexico, you can do, you know, like make uh, anything. But it's, for me, it's very important the foundation. Yeah. And that's what I do in my classes. So you can get creative, you can change it, but you have to know what you're changing and where what the story is behind it. Yeah. Miriam, exactly. have you been able to observe this? You've been a consultant on Taco Chronicles. We see you on <laughs> Netflix all the time. Um, Anything surprising to you in terms of how, you know, this moment that we're in where Netflix is not doing one, but two seasons, <laughs> just yes. about tacos. I love the tacos. Yes, sir. It's going to arrive. What I was thinking is um, the, I, I, I think it's important for American people or people around the world that Mexican society is modernizing society is a globalized society that it means that we are changing all the time and this is normal and we have to right to do it you know because sometimes i feel that we have to remind in the ancient style and all the no the rest of the world has the possibility to change and then choose go to mexico to find the traditional no way of life but please remain like that. Don't change. Don't change. Right. And, and only you no know, became like a folklorism. You know? That uh, I think it's very important that what uh, Irving said. It's very important to recognize you no know, the beginning, to recognize the foundation, to recognize all of that. But I think that also we have to recognize that. People here in Mexico, this is a normal and industrialized, industrialized society. That it means that all the people is changing. We don't have the time to cook and raise the food and cook in the ancient no way. You know, all of this, I think, is very important to understand 
what happened today in Mexican society and Mexican food, you know? In the, the incredible creativity. There's so much creativity. Everyone yes. has, their, every town has, has so much variety, just even from household to household, from town to town. And then, you know, in, in urban context, you just see this incredible flourishing of human ingenuity. I have to say, I mean, it, I, I, I wrote about it with a little bit of horror, but you know, I mean, the Dori Loco, that's just a, a, a monument to human creativity. <laughs> you put the cucumbers on the Doritos, you have a whole mashup yes. of a million different things. <laughs> and in the Taco Chronicles, you can say the, the episode about Cochinita, that everything is very traditional, and at the same time, uh, look the, the suadero or pastor, yeah. that they are a very urban tacos, no? And this is Mexico. This is a Mexico, a, a very a diverse society and changing and no constantly in relationship around the world and, and very, mm -hmm. very diverse culturally with people yes, from around the world. Uh, well, we have so many questions in the chat that are great um, questions, and I see um, Irwin has some fans here. Uh, this week, <laughs> right? um, Sari, uh, why don't you help us navigate the the questions that have been coming in? Thank you so much, Alicia, and thank all of you for this amazing conversation. Obviously, we could be talking about this all night and never stop, and I wish we could. Um, so let's try and take like the next 15, 20 minutes. And Eowyn, yes, so many fans here. I love it. Okay, um, this first question is from Jose, uh, and it's for Teresa. Today, many cacao and chocolate industry players in Mexico seek to establish a self-sustaining cacao production. Many who live in Mexico City, Monterey, or abroad, for context, cacao production in Mexico has never been an economic powerhouse um, because of NAFTA, plant disease, et cetera. What would Pazanos in Vermont think about this initiative? Do they hold an attachment to their agricultural labor that, like for those who had it back in Chiapas or Tabasco? Yeah, super interesting. So um, yeah, a lot of the farm workers in Vermont are both from cacao regions and you know they're from families who grew cacao um, a lot of um, folks are also from coffee growing regions especially those in Chiapas and it's interesting a number of the people that I've uh, worked with have actually gone back to Mexico often not entirely by choice but because of circumstances and um, family you know obligations and a number of them have actually taken you know, some of what they've learned in Vermont, especially Vermont's like this kind of hyper localized food system, right? We're really about local food here, um, really about cooperatives here. And they've taken some of those interests back to their communities. And one woman that I've worked really closely with has now um, kind of re-entered her family's um, coffee, um, coffee farm and they're uh, doing this really interesting cooperative development. So I think people, you know, look on that with some romanticism. I think people do think about their families farming with sometimes rosy, you know, rose tinted lenses about, you know, the beauty of it and the, the naturalness of it. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of room for um, following some of these, you know, direct trade models and pursuing that in a way that might hopefully improve people's livelihoods back, back home when they return. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, sort of so interesting to me, the kind of nostalgia that is wrapped up with these farms and the real sort of um, strong love that people have for food and for the landscapes that, you know, food comes from, um, especially when they're milking cows, which is you know, a very different form of labor. Yeah. Okay, um, next question is kind of directed to everyone. How do we feed the world so that everyone has quality, not just wealthy people eating quality, healthy heirloom ingredients? Do we have to go backwards to just eating locally? Can small farms provide? Paloma, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Do you want to start? I think that something that comes to mind is I see a lot in the comments of maybe a tension between being very protective of in traditional food ways or modernizing and going forward as though these things were not already taking place at the same time or you know what I mean there, there seems to be some kind of like what do we do with the timeline how do we go back and I think we need to consider that indigenous lives and lifestyles are still under attack 
So it's not about going backwards. It's about providing the circumstances and making sure we have policy that allows these, um, these food ways to exist at all because we still have colonial extraction taking place. So it's not a matter of going back, it's about stopping this process or, or curtailing this process that has been ongoing for hundreds of years. Not saying let's, let's not be modern. It's not, um, yeah, so I guess I, I, I'm seeing this like idea of like, should we go backwards? I don't think anybody is saying that we should go backwards. I think everybody in, you know, in the indigenous American as uh, indigenous Americas are part of the modern circumstances and have an aware, you know, and have an awareness of themselves as such. So there's not these little bubbles of native peoples that don't interact with modern circumstances or globalized circumstances, you know, with an intelligence to that. Um, so I, I think it's about people having the right to exercise some stewardship that has been for hundreds of years violently, they have been violently deprived of their stewardship. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to just write the course moving forward rather than some idea of nostalgia or going back or trying to reestablish uh, gender hierarchies so that women, you know, are getting up at four in the morning and grinding, you know, maize, uh, you know, uh, on the metate from, you know, or the, what is it, the, what, what, what do you call it? The, do I say it right? The volcanic stone, you know, from, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so I don't, I don't see that the conversation is asking for that, uh, but just that the stewardship needs to be acknowledged rather than just continuing to extract from there and placing it in the hands of the hemispheres most elite. Then that's just that that just comes to mind seeing all of these like comments that evoke pastness as though indigenous people were desiring some kind of museum diorama um, that didn't engage with contemporary circumstances. I think what you say is so important in terms of the element of, of agency and stewardship and what you were saying earlier, Paloma, in terms of kind of the, um, the way that some, you know, chefs, uh, elite white chefs often will kind of have this salvage thing about, about certain foods. We see a similar thing happening with this very strange futurism of, you know, certain tech, um, entrepreneurs saying we're going to, you know, uh, find another planet to live on, or we're going to live in the ocean on floating, you know, cities, or we're going to, um, you know, all drink, you know, weird shakes that are the perfect nutrition, right? When there's, um, there's uh, indigenous futurism that has already taught us for thousands of years how to regenerate, regeneratively um, thrive with the natural environment continuously into the future and we've suppressed that knowledge. And so it's not about going back, but about, I think, appreciating what, what has been violently suppressed and giving it um, you know, more room, getting out of the way in order for, for that knowledge and the keepers of that knowledge to instruct us how to move forward into a better future for all of us. And particularly we're, it, it, with climate change, right? That is everybody's job wherever they are to make sure that we're demanding policies that protect these, the um, environments that allow these food ways to, 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 to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, I spent time in, in Huautla de Jimenez, which is the highlands of, in Oaxaca, the Sierra Mazateca, and it's rainy in the summertime it's cold, it's damp. I always bring my special like socks. It's July, but I know I'm gonna freeze in the Highlands. <laughs> and the last time I went, it was dry and it was hot mm. and it was terrifying. Mm. So when we talk about an assault on indigenous peoples, it's, it goes way beyond just, you know, access to lands that NAFTA um, has, has uh, you know, violently 
intruded on, right? It's, it's, it's more than just reallocating who has access to these lands or who has ownership or the privatization of lands that no longer, that small farmers no longer can compete. It's also just the basic sun beating down, water coming down, erosion of soils, just traditional methods are not going to, you know, people are going to have to migrate and leave these spaces and leave this, these knowledges of food cultivation if we're not doing everything we can to ensure um, that there is a climate there that is favorable to the ways that, um, to, to growing food, you know, to having these. So they thrive on the, the, um, the uh, mushroom, the psychoactive mushroom um, that grows in Oaxaca. They're like, well, that's not gonna be a thing anymore. Mm. So you're going to have all of this knowledge that's going to be displaced mm. because the highlands, the climate itself has changed. Mm. And where are people going to go? What is going to happen to their languages, their knowledges? Um, they, and also it was the first time that I saw them have machine made tortilla mm. that tasted like baking soda. Mm. You know, it tasted terrible. And they had history. I've never, been you know with these people that I've known for 20 years um like I had never eaten tortilla or food that that tasted like that before so it was it was alarming it was really alarming to go back um and see these things feel like really uh sad you know disheartening thanks bueno, también, uh, oh, I'm sorry uh I just want to say something about the huitlacoche Mm -hmm. I saw the news, somebody in the United States want to uh, reintroduce, but it's, all, it's always there in Mexico. Here they tried to kill the, uh, the fungus from the corn. And now I saw news, somebody want to like reintroduce, but it's kind of like colonialism about the with la coche. It's like, Two weeks ago, I read the, I read the article, and the same idea, you know, the field first. I was looking for the local farmers. I asked for the Huitlacoche because I want to introduce them in the taqueria, quesadillas, the Huitlacoche, and nobody has because they put chemicals to kill the fungus. Mm -hmm. Now somebody has the idea to, like, make um, a patent. You know, it, right? to yeah. Patent it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so like, it's, it's always there. But yes. these guys now is gonna be like, oh, it's our products because we work to introduce the United States. It's always there, but they just, you know, they manage to to do whatever they want to to take over something from us. And also for me, uh, with La Goche is is one of the the the, the the most uh, delicious uh, feet, and now it's like we want to introduce to you like uh, with la coche it used to be there like no it's always there but there's a lie and uh, like two weeks ago I read an article mm. and I think this is part of the like, same and, you know first demonize something and then some white dude come and say like I'm gonna see this one something mm. like that it's always like that that's not fair Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, kind of to that point, there's a, and I apologize in advance because there's so many good questions and I'm so sorry. I know we're not going to be able to get to all of them tonight. Um, this one from Ian, what are things we should be on the lookout for when we're looking for purveyors of Mexican cuisine that take the same level of care and respect for the ingredients and the context that Irwin does for those of us who don't live in New York City? Maybe Irwin, since you're in my screen, maybe you, you want to start with your answer to this question. Maybe you can't hear me. Say it. Oh, yeah. So when people are looking for Mexican food in the United States, what are things to look out for to make sure um, it's, it, they're coming from Mexican purveyors? So when they're looking for food, like, for example, your taqueria, what, what, what should people be looking for to make sure they're getting uh, Mexican food that's actually coming from Mexican chefs. The best ingredients. Mm -hmm. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that, I mean, 
That's a good question and very hard to answer because uh, when I when I opened the taqueria, they said like, this is not taco. I had to fight with them. Like, this is the original recipe from Yucatan, Cochinita Pibir. I had to explain the history. Taco Arabe. I had some influence for the Middle East, but this like from Puebla City, you know. And Pozole, the same, because they don't know the history of each dish. So it's very hard to find like uh, the dish from Mexico because so much media like getting into the uh, Mexican cuisine, people getting confused. That's why I said early uh, when, I, when I make food for me is freedom because it's a true dish supposed to be like that. We, because uh, many uh, corporations, they make uh, like bomb, bombing in the commercials and TVs and the media, they sell you something. And the idea they sell you is like new. And they tell you, this is your culture, this is our tradition. Something on the package, something in the season, like you put the meat, even like two days ago. Mm. I make a, a steak, you know, with herbs and taco, taco, taco de asada. I put herbs, salt, pepper, no season, and this, this is not good. And um, I said, you want something, you, do you don't like it? I want to make you something for you. I use Goya, I put it in the Goya meat. Ah, oh, this is perfect. Because it has been brainwashed. Brainwashed? Yeah, like that. Many people are like that. They think it's like that because they saw a lot of TV, a lot of commercial, and then they think they're the way it is. And that is new. It's not even 100 years old. All those products. I was like, my friend, he works with me. He was like, why is it like that? Don't worry, I'm gonna fix it. Put some Goya and give it to them. He was <laughs> happy. At the same time, I was sad because he's losing something very deep in this tradition. He's going with, with the ships, right? And that's, that's the challenge when I make food every time because sometimes this don't put sauce in my taco because it's too hot. It is the way it is. Mexican food has sauce. I can do on the side. Feel, I feel sad because they don't know how good it is to uh, have a hot sauce in the taco. <laughs> and yes, many dishes are still unknown because um, commercials and the media make bombs of uh, commercial to tell you what is good for you and they really you have to look in your past with your ancestors they're gonna you're gonna see which one is good food and delicious and you're gonna see what is really your traditions through food mm -hmm. thank you thanks Ewan. all right um we're gonna do one more question uh, this is from Fernando. Removing how COVID has highlighted childhood and overall obesity in Mexico, how can the recent labeling of junk food in Mexico, limiting its sale to kids, especially in the poorest states, help promote a healthier diet within these states? Miriam, you're in Mexico. Perhaps you can respond. Uh, you got to unmute yourself. I, uh, it's a very good uh, question and very interesting and is now now the problem. First, I, I have to say, first of all, that it's important to see that we have a obesity problem in Mexico, but it's always important to say that now in this uh, pandemic situation and specifically in Mexico, uh -huh, COVID is not only affecting obese people or diabetic people. No, we have to say and focus on, on maybe, no, in, uh, instead we see in or all focus in, in um, <clears throat> obese and, and diabetic and we focus on uh, socioeconomic uh, level. We know that reveals that is in poor people uh -huh, where uh, COVID is more 
no? Acute, uh, an acute problem. So what, first of all, we have to say is now in our public health specialists and authorities, they are only focusing in bodies and not focusing in the structural problems of poverty, okay? That after that, no, they decided, okay, the labeling is not new, it's, it's a process that began the, the, the last administration, but labeling, it's difficult uh, going to, to solve anything if we don't have uh, policies to guarantee the, security, the food security, because food security is the main, the main uh, the determinant for obesity. Uh -huh. So I think it's very unfair to, to make this kind of regulation with no, no, with no at the same time or first put the, the, the food policies in order to guarantee no, the food security for all the people. And if you have this, no, this guarantees, then you can put all the regulations, but put first the regulation and after that put, no, the, the few uh, security systems, I, I don't feel comfortable with that, no? And also we have a lot of distortions and uh, misunderstood about labeling and the, la the label system is going to get to, to begin, no, to, to begin, sorry, uh, being, uh, it's, it's legal or it's, or it's mandatory, uh -huh, October 1st, no? But now there are a lot of products, no? With labels and people are so confused. And they don't understand, for example, why, no? Uh, Papa Sabritas is free to lay uh, chips. Uh -huh. they, are, they only have one label, uh -huh. Anna and Amaranto, a bar, an amaranto bar that means alegria and alegria, uh, have two or more labels. What is going on there? No, mm -hmm. and it's true that uh, no frito lay has reduced sodium in the last ten years. That is true, but people don't uh, don't trust in the labeling, no, and they don't trust in the labeling. Why? No, why is the alegria have two labels and? With, this is only one example. I am uh, making a collection of reactions in social uh, media now, and uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to observe. But but really more than interesting, I think it's very it's a, it's a, I'm worried about that because it's going to have a lot of uh, social impacts and understood. Uh, misunderstood impacts and more difficult to have a good uh, food choices for health, for your family, etc. No? And I, I now don't understand, no, in this moment I have a 17 years old kid, a boy, or I don't, I don't know, no? and now he's able to, to drive a car, but not to buy <laughs> a frito lays or a cookies or a soda. It's not <laughs> logical, you know. No, it's it's very it's very disturbing for me. I think he, I'm not very optimistic about that. And as always, anthropologists we have not consulted. And uh, I think always um, nutritional education uh -huh, always have an impact a social impact in cultural, food cultural people, huh? and people, food and uh, nutritional knowledge to food choices. And if these message are not enough clear, uh -huh, that will become a very confusing, no? Confusing problem to, to make good choices in a very restrictive environment, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Thank you so, so much. Sorry, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I don't think many of us are optimistic about that many things at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I am optimistic that we can do this again. <laughs> <laughs> and we can keep having important, meaningful conversations um, with, with all of you. So thank you so much. I'm so sorry that we have to wrap. But I promise that I will send everyone an email tomorrow 
with uh, all the resources that were mentioned tonight, all the social media, social media handles of everyone on the panel, so you can follow them, and of course, links to buy their books. Um, and of course, Irwin's Tacoria, so you can go eat delicious food. <laughs> um, Alicia, especially, I, I really want to thank for helping to organize this, and, and you know, you were just so amazing to work with, and it was such a pleasure to meet all of you. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight, and please vote. <laughs> and of course, stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you.